basically review some basic Doppler principles, and, and then I'll show you how we use Doppler to assess uh, flow, area, and pressure calculations. So the basic thing for ECHO is there's a number of standard views, and these are really the workhorse views, um, to create an image of the myocardium and the valves, uh, and even the stuff around the heart, but also fundamental views to get Doppler angulation to measure uh, flow and pressure. So this little uh, graphic on the left shows sort of the, uh, the ones we use all the time. So the apical view, the parasternal view, and the subcostal. We also do some, some other imaging up sort of up near the sternal notch, but these are the sort of the three workhorse views. You got to think of this as a, uh, it was taught to me many years ago, as a sort of a 2D magic knife. You, you sort of create this slice through the heart, and the slice is what's displayed. And it's important to recognize that you're only seeing a slice on the screen. Uh, you're not seeing any of the depth, even if you add uh, 3D echo and you get a volume determination. But for, the, for most of what you're seeing, you're just seeing a slice of the heart, recognizing that uh, you can sort of scan into and out of that slice. But this is an accurate depiction of the image that gets displayed by looking up through the apex. So this will give you a four-chamber view, three-chamber views, subcostal views, which are important uh, for uh, determination of uh, fluid and things uh, around the heart. But the other thing to recognize is that these images uh, are the workhorse for transthoracic, and largely they're also replicated fundamentally on transesophageal echo. So it's, it's, it's a good sort of starting point to think of echo images as derived from these basic views. Um, how do we get a basic image of the heart? Starts like this. So the wedge always shows you where the ultrasound is. The ultrasound probe is always at the top of the triangle. So you're looking down. This is an apical view, apical four chamber, looking down at the four chamber view of the heart. The system admits high frequency bursts of sound, and then it listens. This is how long does it take for the sound to bounce back to the probe? And based on the timing, knowing that blood, uh, or rather the ultrasound travels through the body at this speed, 1540 meters per second. It does the quick calculation and say, okay, well, how long did it take for the object I hit to bounce back and recreate the image? So calculating the depth, the speed of sound in the human body, it's able to sort of quickly take a lot of ultrasound samples and recreate this image, which is created by the slice I showed you from the apex. Simply just to contrast normal above with prolapse below, this is a prolapsing posterior leaflet. So otherwise they're very similar images. But that's a sort of a, an example of the 2D image that's created by ultrasound going through uh, the body. Now, that's not really Doppler. Doppler is looking at uh, waveforms uh, within that image. So this is sort of basic example. So the, you take the ultrasound probe and it emits a certain frequency and it, that's determined by the sonographer and by the depth and there's some automatic elements with the, within the machines. But for example, if you emit it at 10 hertz, which is a high frequency in the range of ultrasound, you would have very good resolution because there's lots of beams, lots of waves that can hit tissue and then bounce back. But these waves kind of peter out. So you get low penetration, but high resolution. So the trade-off there in Doppler is that if you want deeper penetration, you have to use lower frequency waves that give you lower resolution. So you've all seen if you do a carotid ultrasound, you're only imaging a centimeter and a half, you do a very high frequency probe, very nice resolution, you're very close to the skin, that high resolution doesn't have to go deep at all. Whereas if you scan from the belly, looking up at the atria, you've got to go 15 to 18 centimeters, your resolution will be lower uh, because your frequency has to be higher. So this is this trade-off between resolution and frequency. That's all I want to emphasize with that element. Now frequency shift is really, um, very important to the concept of Doppler. So again, this is the probe shown here. It sends off uh, a wave of ultrasound at whatever frequency you've predetermined. If the, sh if the frequency that bounces back is higher, so there's been a shift to make the frequency higher than what left the probe, that indicates that the target is moving towards the probe. So in this case, red blood cells that are moving towards the probe will cause the frequency shift to go higher. In contrast, red blood cells that are moving away from the probe will cause a frequency shift lower. So that concept of shifting f the frequency of the wave that's transmitted is, is the basic premise for determining what direction the blood's going in uh, and the frequency at which it's moving. This is all credited to Christian Doppler, who was an actual person who always had a capital on his name. So Doppler should always be capitalized, even in an EMR. You need to capitalize the D. All right, so Doppler applications, how do, how do we use Doppler? Um, this is an example again. So this is the probe, this is the blood flow 
RBC is moving towards the probe, and the way that gets displayed is with this sort of display here. So this is what this represents on a pulse wave Doppler is blood flow moving towards of a fairly uniform population. The more uniform this line is, this is time across the bottom, but this is a population moving in. The more this looks like a thin line drawn by a pencil, the more uniform the flow, the more laminar the flow. So we get direction, quantitative direction, quantitative information from Doppler about the direction of flow and the velocity of flow. That's what's shown here. But we also get some qualitative information. So again, this is, say, the laminar flow, for example, in the left ventricular outflow track. Um, if you've got a normally contracting LV, nice spiral laminar flow going out a normal aortic valve, you have flow that's of a uniform population. Uh, the machines do this Fournier fast transform to sort of convert this information into a Doppler profile. But this is the one I mentioned. It looks like it's drawn by a pencil. So that's a very uniform flow population. Contrast this to what's happening down here with aortic stenosis, very turbulent flow, high velocity flow. There's a mixture of a whole lot of different flow populations now. You've got some that are going fast in the middle, some that are going slower as they hit the, the walls and slow down. And this looks like this sort of filled in Doppler profile. So get, this is sort of uh, qualitative information about the, the character of the flow. So we also get that from Doppler. Now, how do we actually calculate things with Doppler? We measure stroke volume, regurgitant volume, and pressures. So this is uh, the basic pr principle. Again, imagine an outf uh, an outf any kind of tube, but we often refer to the left ventricular outflow tract as a tube. Flow volume equals cross-sectional area times at the integration of the velocity. So the VTI, also confusingly called the TVI, means exactly the same thing. As the time velocity integral, this is the p integration of all those peak velocities within the, the period, the ejection period. And that basically is a unit of distance. So the VTI is distance. The area is centimeters squared. Distance times area equals volume. That's the basic math. This is an example of how it gets done. Diameter of the left ventricular outflow tract. Assumed it's a circle. We know from Taver literature that it isn't always a circle, um, but we still apply that, uh, that um, assumption. Uh, D squared times a constant equals area times distance derived by Doppler equals volume. That's, that's the basic workhorse we use every day in the echo lab. How do we use it to make calculations about a particular patient? Here's the applied to mitral inflow. Again, you measure the diameter of the mitral annulus. Uh, if you assume it's a circle, then it's easy to get the area uh, at that point. You measure the distance blood travels at that same point. Area times distance equals volume. So mitral inflow into the LV is 120. You assume continuity. Whatever enters the ventricle has to leave the ventricle. So then you measure what leaves the ventricle. Like I just showed you, area times distance equals volume. So if 120 enters and only 70 leaves, this has to go somewhere. So this is the derivation of the mitral regurgitant volume. So that's the only other place you could go, unless there's a VSD. So basically, that's the quantitative Doppler calculation of regurgitant volume. Now, how do we use that? We can do regurgitant volume and do all kinds of things with that. But that's the basic concept, and you can apply it to different valves. Um, so in this case, for an aortic regurgitation, you would look at the aortic stroke volume, take away the systemic stroke volume, and that could be, as I just described, the mitral inflow or the pulmonic flow or even an average of the two. But it's important to recognize that the volume calculation and the impact of that on any one patient may be different. So a 20 milliliter regurgitant volume on a man who's 290 pounds, 6 foot 5, with a forward stroke volume of 110 mils that 20 mil regurgitant volume may not be a big deal. But that same 20 mils uh, applied to a woman who's four foot nine, 100 pounds, and a forward stroke volume of only 50 mils would make a big difference. So the concept is you take that regurgitant volume that you've calculated and you, and you divide it by the volume of that valve. So that's sort of an indexed regurgitant volume for the patient. And then you take it a step further and derive a regurgitant orifice area. We generally only do this for the mitral valve, but the concept applies uh, for all the valves. Essentially, you take that same regurgitant volume you calculated, and you just divide it by the distance measure, which is the VTI. Volume divided by distance equals area. So you don't have to memorize all this. You're going to see this a lot. But those are sort of the general concepts to be familiar with. Regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, and derived valve orifice area. Um, this is the application of calculating uh, area, particularly you could do this on the mitral or the aortic is typically where it's done. And the idea is that uh, flow continuity. So this is, again, an aortic example. We're going to calculate the aortic valve area. 
We know the stroke volume on one side of the valve has to be equal to the stroke volume on the other side of the valve. It didn't go anywhere else. So volume equals volume. Volume broken down equals cross-sectional area times distance equals cross-sectional area <coughs> times distance. The unknown in this equation is the aortic valve area. So you just rearrange the equation dividing LVOT stroke volume by the VTI of the aortic jet, and that's how you get an aortic valve area. Um, in addition, we want to be able to estimate pressures. This is all credited to um, Bernoulli. Uh, it doesn't project well with a bunch of weird things that aren't present on my laptop, but that's okay because we're going to ignore most of that. Uh, these things just really aren't relevant uh, in the physiologic system. So there's no viscous friction to worry about. These things are negligible, the convective acceleration. Um, V1 generally is normal flow within the outflow tract, which is typically around 1. 1 times 1 squared is not a big deal. That's really, you know, the most that gets is 4. So you can get, usually just ignore V1, um, usually I say, which simplifies all of this down to the trans valvular pressure gradient most of the time is just the delta P. That's what that's supposed to be. It really doesn't like the delta symbol. Uh, it's delta P equals 4 V squared. So four times the velocity squared. So for example, aortic stenosis, you measure peak velocity of four meters, four V squared. So that's a peak gradient of 64 millimeters mercury. That's it. The one caveat is when you're very hyperdynamic and your V1 is not negligible. So if you've got an EF of 80%, um, then sometimes this becomes a bigger value and you do have to actually think about incorporating V1. But that's beyond today. For the, the one to remember is delta P equals four V squared. So here's, again, our aortic example, laminar flow within the outflow tract, aortic valve that's stenotic. This is an uh, anatomic area. So if you do CT planimetry or TEE planimetry or even MRI planimetry, you're going to get a certain valve area. Recognizing there is a little contraction of flow as it goes across this area. So just distal to the anatomic area is an effective area. Um, the more stenosis there is, the greater this difference. So the effective area might be 0.5, the anatomic area might be 0.7. So there is a little bit difference, uh, which is one of the, you know, it's important to acknowledge when you're comparing methodologies, planimetry versus derived. So MRI can derive an area, I'm sorry, MRI does not, cath uh, derives an area, and echo derives an area, so it's an effective area. So they're a little bit different. Um, over here, on the velocity side, two meters per second is normal. Above two meters per second is abnormal for a normal flow. Four meters per second is again across the aortic valve indicates severe stenosis. So just an example, this is a very severe stenosis with a mean grade in the 90s. The guidelines show you this stuff. You're gonna, if you haven't already, no, you'll hear this in the AS talks uh, following. But all of the quantitation for most valve lesions is entirely based these days on Doppler parameters. So the velocity of the jet, the mean gradient, in the derived valve area. Uh, these are the numbers, a lot of controversy around this um, uh, guideline cutoff for severe aortic stenosis. The reason being, if you look at a study that looked at hundreds of patients with aortic stenosis and looked at the valve area and the mean gradient, a mean gradient of 40, which is generally very well accepted as a cutoff for severe stenosis, really correlates with a valve area of about 0.8. Uh, not 1.0. So many think that 1.0 is a valve area cutoff is sensitive, but not specific enough for severe stenosis. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but just so you know the concepts. Again, they're Doppler concepts. There's this matrix for looking at things like aortic stenosis that bring in, you have to think about what is the gradient and what is the flow, and you can combine all of these things to uh, really jump into the very confusing concepts of low flow, low gradient, low flow, high gradient, low flow, low gradient. So it takes a little while. This, we could do a 20-minute talk on this slide alone. But really, Doppler does depend on the velocity of flow, the volume of flow. OK. Finally, color Doppler. Really just to emphasize, this is some color Doppler. You'll see lots of color Doppler all the time. It's, it's another workhorse in the Echo Lab. Just to Im introduce, uh, it's a display of flow direction and velocity. It is absolutely not a display of volume. Now, um, there's all kinds of gain settings and concepts uh, with color Doppler that can very much impact um, what you're seeing. It also is very much a factor of timing of the flow. Uh, so don't be the cardiologist who sees one still image of a Doppler and makes a determination uh, of valve severity. Uh, you'll be wrong as often as you're right. So in summary, I um, wanted to review the principles of cardiac ultrasound, Doppler frequency shift, and really demonstrate that Doppler is used to assess flow, volume, 
both forward volume and recursion volume, valve area, and pressure gradients. Thanks.